Um, let's see. Luke 14.26. Oh, come on back. Let me get my glasses on. Uh, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. So, here it seems like Jesus is saying, in order to be a Christian, you have to hate your parents. I mean, it's clear, right? That's what, that's what he's saying. Um, and, and some Christian websites will try to explain this by saying, Oh, it doesn't mean hate. It means love less than. And one reason they say that, um, well, apart from just trying to get rid of the problem here, is that if you go back a version to Matthew, Matthew says just that. He says, if you, love, if you don't love me more than your parents, you can't be my disciple. And that's why the Christians are going, that's what it really means. No, that's not what it really means. See, Matt, Mark had a different flavor of it. Matthew upped it a little bit. Luke upped it even further than Matthew. So we have this evolution of this same passage from Mark to Matthew to Luke. The word in question for hate is M-I-S-E-O, if we transliterated it from the Greek, which is uh, miseo which is used in many places in the New Testament, and every single one of them is translated as hate. And there's a reason for it. The word means hate. So, how, if we think there's some way out of this, because it doesn't make sense for Jesus to say, you've got to hate your parents to be my disciple. How would we get out of it? Context! And I'll just spill the beans. You can go read the passage. What Luke is doing as an author is uh, he's taking what Matthew wrote and as Matthew upped Mark, Luke is upping Matthew. So Luke takes it beyond what can be accepted by the people who would read it. He's, he's pushing it way beyond into the realm of ridiculous, uh, we might call this hyperbole, deliberate exaggeration, to stress a point. Uh, it's basically analogous to slapping the listener in the face and saying, hey, I've got your attention now. And so the whole thing here is that Jesus is warning his future would-be disciples to count the costs of becoming a disciple. So he's, he, he makes this, um, this grave and, and epic and, and important. And, and he, he does this by uh, hyperbole, deliberate exaggeration. If you, you can't be my disciple, becoming my disciple is so, it's such an important decision that you need to really count the cost. If you don't hate your own parents and your ch your children and your brothers and your sisters and even your own life, you can't be my disciple. So it's hyperbole. It's Luke putting words in Jesus' mouth, the character of Jesus, to say to the Christians, the readers, you know, this is not something you willy-nilly jump on the bandwagon. And if you read the passage, right after Jesus says that, there's what, exactly what I'm telling you in the passage. Jesus says, what builder of a house would just start building a house before he counts the costs? The whole point of that, of that passage is to kick it up to the point where it makes people go, wow, that really is a grave decision I need to make. Because if Jesus was really speaking to the Jewish, to Jewish people who knew that one of the Ten Commandments was honor your father and mother, um, then, then, you know, they would it, would, it would make them go, wow, like that. And in the context, uh, they would, some, maybe some of them weren't educated in hyperbole and rhetoric, 
and oratory uh, things. And maybe if they heard it or read it, they would interpret it as literal. But that's not how Luke is delivering it uh, based upon the context. Um, and of course, it, it violates the, the, one of the Ten Commandments. It, it doesn't add up um, why Jesus would advise that. So all the evidence that I can see uh, points to the idea that Luke was uh, engaging in deliberate exaggeration to drive home a point. So uh, I would scratch that off my list. Um, but check it out, read the passage, see what you think. Um, you can look at all kinds of examples um, of ways you can interpret it one way or another, but you have to allow these authors to use the tools of the trade uh, that, they, that were available to them at that time. So that's why some of these things, you know, metaphor and figurative, they really are there, but figuring out which ones are and aren't, that's where the rub is, isn't it? Uh, Hosea, that whole thing where he gets a wife, he takes a whore as his wife, that's not God condoning adultery. Jesus Christ! It's, it's an author writing metaphors. See, Hosea is like God, and the harlot wife is Israel. You can figure it out, I bet. Take that and go read the passage. Um, Second Timothy, here's another good one. Second Timothy 3.16, all scripture is inspired by God and profitable for yada, yada, yada. So if that's true, what if we go find some scriptures that clearly aren't inspired by God, some verses in the New Testament? Problem is, 2 Timothy 3.16, when it says all Scripture, since the New Testament didn't exist at the time that was penned, Scripture meant the Old Testament, the Jewish Scriptures. All of that is inspired by God. So you can't say, well, Paul gave his opinion in this verse, and that means that 2 Timothy 3.16 is wrong. So, there you go. Um, so there's a few ideas you can, you can roll around. Um, that's all I'm going to talk about. So, all I'm saying with that whole idea of, of sometimes you can falsely accuse the Bible, be very careful when you see something you think is an error or contradiction or something, and... Do your best to figure out if maybe it's a literary technique or deliberate exaggeration or, or you know, some kind of um, poetic parallelism, uh, metaphors. All these things, might it might be like that. And context is um, important because sometimes the context does alter the meaning. Many times, it only reinforces the face value meaning. So, that's it. So, not everything is an error. All right, um, I'm working on part 14. Uh, I mean, part 14. Uh, it's going to be 40 minutes long, roughly. So, it's going to be three or four videos. I've got it in the bowl. I'm mixing all the ingredients, but I still got to bake it. It's going to take some time. And so my tape's about to run out because I've talked my head off. Uh, so that's going to happen, and it's going to be, you know, it's going to be basically um, interesting. I think I've got, I think I've got that 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 passage figured out now. I've looked at it, and um, God's giving me a word. No, I've I think I've got it figured out to where it makes sense to me now. So, whether it comes out that way in these videos, gosh, it's just so, it's just so much stuff I tried to cram in and make it clear. But anyway, that's it. My tape's about to run out. Um, oh, 
I'm like almost right at 6,000 subs. So anyway, thank you all for the new subs and, and the old subs and the Subway subs and the Russian subs. and Anyway, so um, yeah. And I'm almost at a million video views. Yeah. So, you know, another 14,000 subs and I'll be at 20,000 subs. And then I could put ads all over my vids and make people go, ah, oh, that's, I hate that, and make $5 a month from YouTube. All right, people. Um, part 14, maybe two weeks. So, anyway, uh, that's it. Thank <laughs> you.